Thank you for uh, joining us this evening. Uh, it's a pleasure to host you, Professor Diamond. Um, uh, we have recently launched this webinar series, so this is actually our first event, and we couldn't think of a better name and a better topic to start this series. Um, so uh, your topic is very timely, and uh, given what has happened during the last weeks, uh, it is all the more important. Uh, so I just want to say that we have one hour, uh, and we're looking forward to listening to your talk. Uh, and uh, I just want to remind the, the audience that our uh, next event will be at the end of March and the topic will be uh, decolonizing education. So thank you so much again. And I leave the floor to Professor Mike Hardy. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much. And I, I won't take long at all. Just a, a very big welcome to Professor Larry Diamond. As you know, um, Larry is an American sociologist, a political sociologist, a leading contemporary scholar in the field of democracy studies. And we couldn't think of a better person or a more a timely topic to kick off our, our 2021 series. The Center for Trust, Peace and Social Relations is an eclectic multidisciplinary center. Many of you are working directly with it, but I know we have many guests that, that are visiting, some for the first time. We're a, a, a center that's interested in contemporary challenges and there can't be one more than the one that Larry's going to address. So Larry a, is a senior fellow at the Freeman Spogli Institute for International Studies at Stanford University on the West Coast in, in California, the main center for research on international issues at Stanford. And at the Institute, Larry serves as the director of the Center on Democracy Development and uh, Development and the Rule of Law, and is also a co-editor of the Journal of Democracy. So the floor is yours, Larry. You, you have as, as long as you like, but 30 minutes would be great. And then we'd like some interaction if we could. You're very welcome. Thank you, uh, Mike. And thank you, Bahar, for the uh, invitation. I'm no <laughs> longer director of CDDRL. That's Frank Fukuyama now, but I am part of the leadership team there. So I'm going to talk about the global democratic uh, recession and um, how we can reverse it. I'm going to have to go through these slides very quickly. It normally takes me about 50 minutes to get through all of them, I think, but I'll do so quickly. I'll skip a few and I'm happy to share them if people want them. Let's just remind ourselves that um, it's not only democracy in the sense of popular sovereignty and accountability and free and fair elections that I think people around the world are seeking. It's a higher quality of democracy, liberal in the political sense of protecting minority rights, uh, ensuring strong fidelity to international human rights norms, uh, ensuring some decent and meaningful floor of political and uh, social equality among uh, all people. And Republican government in the platonic sense of a good government that is not captured by an individual or a clique, that is not uh, a tyranny, uh, not a tyranny of an individual, not a tyranny of a majority, but that is a government that is constrained by rule of law and by various agencies of horizontal accountability. If we define two thresholds of electoral democracy and then the subset of electoral democracies that are liberal democracies, this is the standard um, uh, uh, or the distribution of the, these regimes at the end of 2019. I don't have the data yet for the end of last year, but I start with the Freedom House data and that should be released soon. You can see that uh, all of Western Europe uh, and the Anglophone states uh, of uh, the US, Canada, Australia, and New Zealand are democracies and, are liberal demo and liberal democracies. And then it kind of slides down from there. And you can see that the percentage of democracies in Latin America and the Caribbean region, uh, in Northeast, Southeast and South Asia and in Sub-Saharan Africa 
in each case um, have declined since 2012. Uh, Africa, for example, has gone from 37% uh, of the 49 states of the region being democracies to 20, 29%. I think you can see the recession uh, better with this slide that shows the global trends from 1974 through the end of 2019 of electoral democracy, that is the blue line on top, and then the subset of electoral democracies that meet a decent standard, not perfect, of liberal democracy. And that's the orange line below it. And this is showing uh, all countries with populations over 1 million population. And you see what you know that the so-called third wave of global democratization started slowly in Western Europe and then Latin America, then picked up steam as it spread to Asia in the 1980s. And then you had the big bang here uh, with the end of the Cold War and the fall of the Berlin Wall. Uh, and by the early 1990s, we had something that we had never seen before in the history of the world, which is that a majority of states in the world were democracies. And that has persisted. It even reached 57% of states over 1 million population around 2006. But since then, in the last 14 years, uh, democracy has been in decline. And it's been, a, it's been a modest decline, but a steady decline and one that's been gathering momentum. Uh, last year, the varieties of, or 28, around 2018 or 2019, something like that, the Varieties of Democracy Project comes to a similar conclusion. We slipped again below the 50% threshold in terms of the percentage of states that are democracies. And you can see here that if we track the breakdown of democracies by dividing the last 44 years into four 11 year periods, we have in this most recent period running through the end of 2019, a significant acceleration in the rate of democratic breakdowns. Almost one in five democracies broke down during this period. Uh, this is a very famous slide that Freedom House compiles every year, showing the ratio of countries in its database that are gaining in political rights or civil liberties or both in a particular uh, year, compared with the number of countries that are declining. And you can see that during the post-Cold War period from 1991 through 2005, the ratio was in most years quite favorable. Uh, the modal year about two and a half times as many countries uh, gained in freedom as the percentage or the, the number that declined in freedom. And that reversed in 2007. In every year since 2007, more countries have declined in freedom than have gained. Uh, and the rate has been only a, about 70% or even 50% gainers to decliners. Some countries of course have declined dramatically, shockingly. And it's not only the ones that we know about in democracy studies, <clears throat> Turkey, Venezuela, and Hungary, none of which meet the standard of electoral democracy today. Please don't let Viktor Orban get away with describing his political system in Hungary as an illiberal democracy. It is illiberal, but it's no longer a democracy. If you don't have a level playing field uh, in which the people can really choose their leaders and replace them in free and fair elections, the system may have competitive elections, but it won't have democratic ones. The US is still a democracy, though I think we had a pretty close call in the last few weeks, but we've declined uh, significantly. And I think Freedom House's assessment will show a significant further decline uh, during the calendar year 2020. 
This is how the US uh, compares with other established democracies on the Freedom House scale, uh, the more finely grained zero to 100 scale of political rights and civil liberties. Uh, the US is the red line here. Note that we have declined from a peak of 94 out of 100 around 2007 to 2009. Uh, during this period, and that uh, by 2019, we declined to 86 out of 100. The um, United Kingdom is doing somewhat better. Uh, it's the broken blue line here. Uh, and it was rated at 94 at the end of last year. Uh, the light blue line is Japan, dark blue line Canada, and then of course Sweden is always on top. You get a rather uh, different picture, but not a more favorable picture for the United States. If you take the three leading scales uh, of annual democracy ratings, that is Freedom House, the Economist Intelligence Unit, and the varieties of democracy scale of liberal democracy and simply uh, average them uh, all uh, while standardizing them on zero to 100. And here again is the United States, which you see by this average scale declining from a score of 90 to 79. That's really quite a big decline. Uh, Italy has declined a little bit. Uh, France has improved. Japan looks much less favorable here. And um, here's the United Kingdom again, uh, even with the average of these three, not much change. Uh, the two best performers by either measure Freedom House or the average are Canada and of course, Sweden. What I think we need to note is that there's been a general downward slide uh, in all kinds of regimes. As you can see, liberal democracies are becoming less liberal. Electoral democracies are in crisis and many of them in Latin America, in Asia and elsewhere have been breaking down in Africa. Um, and you can see uh, now we, I, I think probably will witness once again the descent of democracy in Sri Lanka now that the Rajapaksas uh, are back in power. I think the Philippines has probably slipped below the minimum conditions of democracy. We have a number of what we call <clears throat> competitive authoritarian regimes. That is, they're not democracies. They don't have free and fair elections but they allow political opposition. The opposition wins a significant number of parliamentary seats and local elections. And there is pluralism, space, dissent, and uh, some opposition victories even within a rigged political framework. It's a mixed system. What we've been seeing, including the recent elections in Tanzania and most recently in Uganda in 2014, in uh, January 14th, is, and of course in Cambodia in their recent elections, is that these regimes are moving to being more brutally repressive and more devoid of meaningful opposition. Tanzania <clears throat> and Cambodia are now effectively one party states. And the authoritarian regimes are becoming uh, uh, ever more authoritarian, Russia, China, Egypt, and so on. I think to understand what's happening in the world, we have to understand the process of democratic decay, which is sometimes called creeping autocracy. It is um, uh, a multi-step process of destruction of the guardrails uh, and checks and balances of democracy <clears throat> and uh, the rise of authoritarian populism. Populism uh, has, as I think you know, these common features. It's anti-elitist. 
it's anti-pluralist because it doesn't believe in allowing for multiple competing points of view. Therefore, it has hegemonic tendencies. Populists claim to be the only legitimate representative of the true and deserving people. And of course, if you're Muslim, if you're black, um, if you don't agree with them, uh, if you come from some other underrepresented minority, you're very probably not part of the true and deserving people of the country. Certainly if you're an immigrant, uh, that's a universal among uh, illiberal populace. And so they have a notion of democracy that's plebiscitary. Uh, they think there is a plebiscite, there's an election, their leader and party win, and then everybody else better shut up and submit to it until the next election. They're anti-institutionalists. They don't believe in checks and balances. They don't believe in the restraints of established institutions that would limit the autonomy of the ruler and the populist party. They are of course illiberal in their intolerance of religious, ethnic and other minorities. And they tend to be ultra nationalist. They work and other authoritarians in this period work through a kind of 12 step program of starting with a spirited electoral democracy and finishing with a competitive authoritarian regime. And you can look over these uh, 12 uh, steps, which I take from my book, Ill Wins. But uh, I think many of them are familiar to you as you've been watching what um, uh, Recep Tayyip Erdogan has been doing in Turkey, uh, Orban in Hungary. Before that, Hugo Chavez, uh, Vladimir Putin, more recently, Rodrigo Duterte in the Philippines and so on. And of course, Donald Trump uh, em embraced many of these. And uh, fortunately, he didn't uh, succeed in being in power long enough or desecrating the institutions vigorously uh, enough to uh, pull off this agenda completely. You begin by demonizing and delegitimizing the political opposition, again, is not reflecting the true and real people. Then early on, you work to undermine the independence of the courts, which by the way, were a crucial institution constraining Trump and preventing him from imposing his authoritarian agenda. And the same was true of, of the mass media, although he had his slavish echoing voices in the mass media. But uh, successful authoritarian populists go to work on undermining the independence of the media and its financial base. You gain control of public broadcasting, you try and constrain the internet and gradually you work on uh, decimating the autonomy and will of all these other sectors of society and of the state that stands separate and apart from and capable of checking the excesses of uh, an illiberal, uh, potentially authoritarian ruler until there's not much left. Then once you gain control over the political system and the state, you do what Orban has done, you rig the electoral rules. So it's almost impossible for the opposition to come back into power. You take control over electoral administration and you're, you're off to the races. Of course, the pandemic, the COVID-19 pandemic has presented new threats to democracy uh, that we've seen all over the world. Uh, the way I would summarize it is what a gift to authoritarian rulers. Anytime you have an emergency, uh, a bona fide uh, public health or national security emergency, autocrats are going to use it to uh, claim the need to enhance their power and uh, eliminate whatever checks remain. And even a number of democratic governments have been um, instituting digital surveillance systems that 
have their utility in tracking the COVID-19 pandemic and the contacts people have had, but if they're not carefully monitored can represent very serious threats to privacy. Why do we have this democratic recession? Well, I think there are multiple reasons. First of all, a number of states have had a, a weak rule of law uh, with uh, very vulnerable judiciaries and widespread corruption. And then you get rulers that aggrandize their power. And uh, if the constraints are not strong or they're able to weaken them, they have a clear running field for enhancing their power in an authoritarian direction. Political polarization is part of the story in almost all of these breakdowns. And of course, what rulers do is exploit existing polarization and try and deepen and accentuate it uh, in order to rally the true deserving people around them and marginalize um, the political opposition, the minorities, the immigrants, uh, everybody who's even a little bit different than the dominant group. Political institutions uh, in the emerging market democracies have tended to be weaker and more vulnerable. If economic performance is poor and a lot of people are kind of disappointed or left out of the uh, success story of the country to the extent there is one. This creates alienation and fertile grounds for recruitment. And of course, where trust in institutions is low, as it is getting lower and lower in the age of social media, this also creates a fertile picture. Then you have the authoritarian power surge. Uh, it's not that just that more countries are moving toward democracy, it's that these two countries, Russia and China, are promoting a, a, a certain brand of authoritarianism by projecting sharp power around the world. This is a major theme of my book, Ill Winds. And even doing as uh, Russia has done in Georgia and Ukraine, as China is starting to do in East Asia, even using more blatant coercion uh, and military force to expand their power and intimidate neighboring democracies uh, as uh, China is trying to do now with Taiwan as it's trying to do with India on the Himalayan border and so on. I think you know about the Russian information war on American democracy, fortunately, uh, it seems to have been quieter or better resisted uh, and recognized uh, in 2020. Uh, we have a much more energetic uh, propaganda apparatus now of China in recent years, trying to promote their authoritarian story and interests. Let me uh, conclude by um, how we push back against this. We need to begin by reviving and improving our own democratic institutions. I don't think promoting and defending democracy abroad needs to wait until we have somehow restored our democracies to clearly better health and authenticity, but we're not gonna have credibility in promoting uh, democracy abroad if we aren't clearly seen to be working to be doing so at home. And this means defending democratic norms and institutions in an era of uh, more acute rejection of them and more vigorous assault on them as we saw on January 6th in, in the United States. I repeat, we have a very serious problem here of defection from democratic norms by a certain segment of our society we need to strengthen in some countries, not all, because uh, some are in good shape in this regard, electoral security and integrity. This is a huge project right now in the United States that I could get into. 
I think democracy, uh, deepening democracy requires reform of majoritarian rules. I am a firm uh, philosophical opponent of first past the post. I think in an era of multiple political parties and tendencies, it's just deeply undemocratic to uh, uh, deny people more choice and to create a situation as you have in Britain in particular, where a political party can repeatedly get a you know, majority of the vote with you know, 42, 44% of the vote and probably even less uh, if you consider what people would do under circumstances where voting for another alternative would not be a wasted vote. So, uh, you know, uh, with the presidential system like the United States, I don't think a multi-party system is a uh, particularly wise combination. Uh, I do favor, um, the alternative vote, ranked choice voting for the US. Countries like Canada and um, uh, Britain could consider doing what Australia has done by embracing ranked choice voting or move all the way to some moderate form of proportional representation. We need to do all these other things, reforming social media to make it more resistant to the withering campaigns of uh, disinformation that are polarizing our society and uh, pummeling democratic legitimacy. We need stronger reforms to combat uh, kleptocracy and money laundering. Uh, I think we're making progress here and the Biden administration will pursue some of what is needed. This is prominent on their agenda. We have to Britain, the US and other democracies and anonymous real estate uh, transactions and anonymous shell corporations and stop being a haven for the laundering of dirty authoritarian kleptocratic Russian, Middle Eastern and African and other funds from around the world. We have to figure out how we can bridge our polarizing differences uh, and uh, this does not exhaust the list, but socially, I think we're going to need much more uh, vigorous policy responses to uh, fashion some kind of more unified and coherent position on immigration and to respond to the economic uh, hurt and the economic needs people have for jobs and for a more decent floor of equality. And now I'll take your questions and comments. That was brilliant, a tour de force, uh, Larry. And we do have um, questions, and that's brilliant to have more time. Do you think there's a relationship? You talked about how much, uh, I'm going to take the first, if I may, um, how much uh, resonance there is with urgencies and emergencies and catastrophes and pandemics um, with, this de with this demise of democracy. But it also seems to be, as you said, that it's when our democracies are weak and we don't look after their strengths. That's also the case. Is it, however, is it just the context that's explaining these downward curves or is it an inevitability in the process, do you think? I think, uh, Mike, there are at least two elements of inevitability. <clears throat> One is uh, that nothing can keep expanding forever, right? Um, so, I, I mean, you just don't see in social, economic or political life, continued uninterrupted progress. You may see sustained progress developmentally over generations, but there are always at least mild recessions, right? There are always dips. And in the case of global democracy, it is the case that democracy expanded to a lot of countries that where the enabling conditions for it were not strong. And so that we might have uh, expected some tough times, but there was no reason we had to expect the stresses mm -hmm. on an uh, assault on a degradation of democracy in countries 
where the enabling conditions and the broader enabling environment could have been judged to be pretty uh, propitious as mm. in Hungary mm. um, or frankly, even Turkey, which has a long history of democratic traditions, not to mention uh, Venezuela and others. Mm. So there was some inevitability there. And I think it is inevitable given human nature mm. uh, that we will see personalities emerge on the political scene and social movements that will challenge democracy, that will feel excluded. So there is this historic continuing challenge to liberal democracy uh, from its discontents and um, you know, uh, uh, more autocratically inclined or in the case of Donald Trump, uh, more deeply psychologically, narcissistically and um, you know, intolerantly inclined, uh, you're going to get these people who feel marginalized, you're going to get these personalities who are cynical and uh, illiberal in orientation. And what we need is uh, resilient democracies to recognize the dangers and stresses and respond early on. Hmm. Yeah, that's really helpful. So let's jump to Rebecca Baker. You had a great question on the chat. Would you like to come in and ask uh, Larry your question? Hmm. I was just uh, wondering whether, when you're considering the decline that we've seen and going back to your earlier point on uh, people searching for better quality of democracy rather than just uh, fundamentals, do we look at conceptions and has the understanding of what a democracy actually contains or means to the populace in these countries shifted? And do we have to consider that the models aren't evolving to actually meet the needs of the new demos uh, in terms of the decline that we're steadily seeing in established democracies? Yes, this is a really, uh, uh, I think, perceptive uh, intervention and I agree with the spirit of it. I think part of the problem not only in the long established democracies, but in some of the emerging ones, is that there are higher expectations of democracy and uh, more energetic and creative demands for meaningful voice and influence and access, uh, stronger demands for transparency as well, and just uh, more skillful and energetic citizens as a result of the distribution of communicating power, monitoring power, participatory potential through the digital revolution. And so I think it is the case that people have higher expectations and that uh, civil society is innovating with new means of organization, voice, monitoring, deliberation, and democracy needs to adapt and, and keep up. Uh, I was part of an experiment and part of an experiment based at Stanford University uh, in deliberative polling called American One Room, which uh, we conducted in uh, 2019 that brought a random sample of the American public together for three days to deliberate on the issues uh, dividing our country. If you Google in America in one room, you'll get to our website. We're hoping to do it again. And my colleague, Jim Fishkin, who runs the Center for Deliberative Democracy, um, has ex been experimenting with this method in some 20 countries and you know has applied it in a meaningful context uh, over 130 times. So uh, I think uh, democratic uh, deliberations, deliberative polling, citizen juries, other means of popular consultation, all of these uh, have great potential in the way we're getting democratic reform of our broken institutions in the United States is mainly through voter initiatives at the state level. So, uh, 
I am hopeful that part of what is going to repair, renew and deepen our democracies and perhaps reduce the gulf between rulers and the people is this creative, experimental, technologically innovating uh, spirit and energy and activity from civil society. And politicians need to be open to it and embracing of it. Thanks, Larry. Matt, Matt Cortrell. Yes, now I'm on mute. Good to see you, Larry, uh, as always. Good to hear you as well. Uh, I uh, wrote a, a, an article in your journal, I suppose, yours and Mark's journal, a couple of years ago about referendums, as you may recall. Uh, and listening to what you just said here, uh, strikes me as being sort of a case for what you might call real populism, Mark II. Uh, about 120 years ago, uh, Americans, especially in the Western states, responded to uh, what they saw as fear of run amok capitalism, uh, too many monopolies, by uh, having or institutionalizing the, the referendum, the initiative, direct elections of senators and so on. So you think that we just basically need to to well upgrade uh, what was the original populism and have more of those institutions and then we can actually come back so that we can you know, make people responsible by giving them responsibility as it were. So uh, yes, this parallel has struck me too, Matt. Thank you very much. And uh, I think that there, as we see uh, voter initiatives now in several states, in the US in the last uh, six to 10 years that have been introducing, I'd say democratizing institutional reforms. Uh, and the big ones have been eliminating partisan gerrymandering of electoral districts by giving the uh, task of redrawing district boundaries to independent uh, redistricting commissions. Uh, improving by uh, uh, making more transparent campaign finance and sometimes introducing elements of public finance and reforming <clears throat> electoral rules, in particular adopting ranked choice voting. As we, we've seen these initiatives or referendums in a number of states, I think they're gathering momentum now and we're seeing more of them. And while I think the referendum process can be abused in some worrisome ways, we've seen that here in the state of California, it's really virtually the only way we're gonna get reform in a lot of these processes because the established politicians don't want them and, and wouldn't normally vote for something that would bind them to greater accountability or <clears throat> or undermine the two-party duopoly in the United States. And as we've seen the growth of this movement in the US, uh, grassroots democracy movement, I think the parallels with the more, I would say positive, <clears throat> although it had its racist elements to it, there were many strands to it in the early 20th century, but the parallels with the more democratic and positive populist uh, movement of the early 20th century are very striking. Larry, today the uh, former Prime Minister Gordon Brown has introduced similar com conversations into our discussions, asking for citizens, local assemblies at local levels, and but he talks about chaos as a result if we don't take this on, so it's very timely. So we have a question from Maya Oren. Hi. You probably you basically started talking about my question, but uh, I really feel that in this area, people are uh, expecting uh, more uh, to, to participate more and and take part in decision making and policy making, and and we do see all these movements all around the world, uh, but but uh, the uh, political systems, as I as I feel in my country, it doesn't uh, react to it. There is no way, it doesn't take, it doesn't, um, it, it doesn't have any influence on the political uh, system. This is a, so uh, even though it's very much expected uh, that uh, 
what is happening in the digital, in the digital environment uh, will affect, I don't see any effect. In the, in the uh, municipality level, we do see it. And uh, so, but and you, you talked about it a little bit. And also I would like to hear your opinion about liquid democracy, because uh, I don't know if uh, even the political parties are relevant anymore. There are no big ideologies. People are issue oriented. So if we're talking about reforming or rethinking democracy, uh, I would uh, like uh, to hear your thoughts about that. Thank you. I think we can reform representative democracy. I wouldn't want to see the elimination of the representative nature of democracy because then I think we're back to the only alternative, which is plebiscitary democracy. Mm. And if you start with a plebiscite, digital or otherwise, weekly or annual, that you think is going to empower the people in a grassroots fashion, the ability for it to be hijacked by an illiberal populist uh, is a, a demagogue, is, an, is enormous. I want to say as well, I am uh, very open <clears throat> using digital platforms and tools for driving and further enabling citizen participation and for um, channeling input more directly into the policy process uh, and creating the goal that I think you're driving toward here, which is renewed levels of serious responsiveness by politicians to citizen preferences. However, we need to be very careful about how we utilize digital tools because digital tools can be hacked uh, and hijacked. And uh, as we're seeing with social media, badly abused and so what I don't favor is a kind of uh, democracy where people are sitting in their living rooms and every week, uh, you know, not that you were suggesting this, you know, or every month, you know, they vote on a proposal and we just forget about the representatives. Um, there's a reason why we have uh, elected representatives uh, so that they can uh, deliberate uh, on the issues with greater information and at least some break on uh, populism. What I think we need is channels of supplementation. And so I'm a big fan of citizen juries and deliberative mechanisms and deliberative polls. Uh, and we can even require uh, that when there is a officially recognized deliberative poll and citizens have been brought together uh, under good conditions, as my colleague Jim Ca uh, Fishkin calls them, with balanced information and an opportunity to really weigh competing sides of an issue, and then they come to a clear decision, we can require that that be considered uh, by the uh, by the parliament or regional assembly or whatever it might be. You know, uh, Mongolia did something very bold uh, uh, in the last few years. They passed a constitutional amendment requiring that any future constitutional amendment be subjected to the input of a deliberative poll of the people. So I think there are ways of, um, of upgrading our democracy uh, by taking seriously the challenge you pose here. Thank you, Larry. Let me go now to Meltem uh, Mustulabak. Perhaps you'd like to introduce yourself. I'm a terrible chair. I didn't suggest that you did. No, that's okay. That's okay. Hi, Larry. This is Meltem Mustulabak. I'm the Dean of Faculty of Arts and Social Sciences at Sabancı University, Istanbul, Turkey. And I worked well together with Larry some time ago uh, for the Journal of Democracy in uh, certain issues. Now, the question I have is, um, you know, something that we try to tackle anyway, and something that you already alluded to in your presentation, which is this. 
is democratic uh, backsliding or democratic uh, breakdown? Is it structural or is it also driven by personal factors? And the, of course, the, the Turkish case is on my mind, but it's also a comparative you know, framework that you can bring in the United States or UK or uh, Hungary. And the specific structural framework that I have in mind is the role of the judiciary and the erosion of judicial independence in these countries where democratic backsliding is now uh, you know, ongoing. So what kind of a role do you think the judicial institutions have a role to play in containing or in uh, acting as a safeguard for democratic breakdown, if at all? I think the role of institutions in defending and securing democracy uh, is indispensable. Mm. And I repeat, the reason why democracy is still standing in the United States today is because our institutions proved robust enough, particularly the independent judiciary, to constrain and hold accountable um, what Trump was trying to do. Uh, I think we've realized some vulnerabilities that we need to repair. Uh, and he was starting to go to work on the civil service. And now my colleague, uh, Frank Fukuyama, uh, is, you know, embarked on a new project to try and strengthen the civil service in the US against some future autocrat. So sometimes we get these stress tests mm -hmm. where, you know, we get uh, an illiberally inclined or authoritarian personality and maybe they don't fully succeed you have what uh, Tom Ginsburg and Aziz Huck at the University of Chicago call a near miss. And we have to learn from the near misses. But of course, when you don't have a near miss, you have a breakdown as in Turkey. Uh, it's a more sobering experience. I would just add that I think these breakdowns uh, are structural in two senses. Um, number one, uh, they are institutional failures as a result of institutions that weren't strong enough and resilient enough uh, and insulated enough to contain the ambitions uh, of the incipient autocrat. But they're also structural in the sense of deep social, economic, and cultural divisions that illiberal actors and parties are able to exploit. Thanks, Harry. So let me ask uh, Gordon, Gordon Crawford now. Thanks, Mike. Thanks, Larry, for the great presentation. Um, my question is in the in the chat. I'm asking uh, to what rise is the to what extent is the rise of authoritarian populism due to rising inequalities and mm -hmm. increasing precarity for large sections of the population, um, noting that that both are associated with a particular form of neoliberal capitalism. So really I'm, I'm wanting to sort of uh, you know, shift the argument a bit to, um, to inequalities and to the uh, economic system and suggest that um, we also need to, that the, the, the problem is uh, of uh, declining democracy is, is also a particular form of, uh, of, of capitalism. In other words, neoliberalism that has been dominant globally now for some uh, four decades, characterized by deregulation, privatization, um, uh, a minimal role for the state, mm -hmm. and um, therefore suggesting that to promote political democracy, we need to also to uh, pay attention to reversing socioeconomic inequalities. Of course, how we do that is another huge question. Um, mm -hmm. But uh, you know, suggesting that we need to pay more attention to the the, the, the role of the the, the state, um, uh, a, a more regulatory state that um, can uh, deal with the uh, some of the worst excesses of capitalism. Thanks. So uh, I think uh, it is clearly the case. I've already um, made the point, uh, just in very general terms that social and economic inequality, <clears throat> joblessness, the movement of de, the deindustrialization 
of significant swaths of the manufacturing heartland uh, of the United States, the United Kingdom, and so on, um, have been uh, contributing to this and probably contributed to this successful Brexit vote, but you would know more about that than I, I do. Um, and that, you know, if we don't deal with issues of economic justice, economic opportunity, not just ensuring that people have a minimum floor of income, but they have meaningful and dignified work. Mm. I think this is very important that work is part of human identity uh, and uh, human satisfaction. And if their work uh, is no longer meaningful and secure, um, you know, even if we could fund a minimum income floor for everyone, it still wouldn't solve the problem. <clears throat> I do want to note that, of course, this factor is one of only, I think, several drivers of the deeper malaise that has been feeding into illiberal trends in advanced industrial democracies. Um, I think the growing pluralism of our societies <clears throat> is another. And you know, you've got this situation in the United States now, where, which is why they were waving the Confederate, Confederate flag uh, uh, in the capital of the United States. What, is, what does the Confederate flag stand for? It's not federalism or, uh, you know, uh, states' rights in some neutral sense of just a greater balance between center and periphery. It's racism. It's a racist symbol of the defense of slavery. Uh, and these people, uh, there were some non-whites in the group. It's a sociologically and psychologically interesting thing to ponder. But this is an overwhelmingly white supremacist movement. Uh, and uh, we've got hard work to do to ponder the sociological drivers of this and how you get traditionally white uh, and more you know, sociologically coherent populations uh, traditionally in Europe to accept the greater uh, racial, ethnic, religious pluralism that is inevitably coming. Mm -hmm. I mean, in Europe in particular, these are aging societies. If you don't import more people, you're not going to have uh, a balance of workers to retirees that's going to be fiscally sustainable. Mm -hmm. So, you know, my advice is, you know, we, we have to recognize that, that, that social pluralism is coming, that it can be invigorating, that it can make for strength, but we can't just assume that it's going to be a smooth and um, accommodating process. So I think that both the economic inequality and the social uh, pluralism are probably equally important contributing factors here. Thanks, Larry. Let me go to Ilan Peleg and then Michelle, and then we'll have to wrap it up, I'm afraid. So, but Ilan, your question, please. Thank you very much for a wonderful lecture. So I wanted to ask you the following question that was raised uh, this morning uh, on the television show on M MSNBC uh, in the context of, N uh, of, of an article written. Uh, and the assumption was, and I think it's the right assumption, that you have tens of millions of, of Americans, and this is certainly true about other countries, who have, are already rejecting everything that we know about liberal democracy, including all the institutions, the values, the courts, the electoral process, and so on and so forth. The question is, what is the strategy that you suggest? The overall strategy is to deal with this kind of reality. I think this is one of the deepest challenges we face in the following two senses. 
first of all, in the era, I think a lot of people don't reject uh, democracy or liberal democracy, but they sincerely believe as a result of uh, intense disinformation and the segmented structure of the flows of information on the internet and in the fragmented world of television media today and so on. They sincerely believe that in the case of the United States, the election was stolen. Mm. Now it's, I think they have reached a point, some of these people where they're truly psychologically incapable of imagining that there can be a democratic and legitimate democratic outcome uh, which doesn't result in the victory of their preferred party in Canada. But nevertheless, we've got to go to work on this disinformation and detachment from reality. Uh, I think it's one of the biggest challenges uh, facing democracy. Uh, the retreat from liberal democratic values of tolerance and accommodation and willingness to lose, I think is a rising challenge uh, in our democracy. I've been involved in a lot of public opinion surveys and a number in the United States fairly recently. And we have found continuing general support for democracy when you use the D word people saying, yes, democracy is the best form of government. But when you pin them down, they're more and more willing to uh, cut slack to uh, their political leader, if their party is in power, to abuse checks and balances in order to get things done that they want. And there is, we noted in our public opinion survey, uh, in early 2020, or mid 2020, I guess, an increasing readiness to justify, condone, or even embrace political violence if their side doesn't win. And this worried us in the context of the right-wing uh, fanatics assault on the Michigan State Capitol in April, marching with their guns right into the State Capitol. So some of us were not surprised uh, entirely by what happened on January 6th. And I think we have a huge challenge ahead of depolarization, uh, de-radicalization, and to some extent deprogramming of what I think has become a cult-like phenomenon mm -hmm. in the United States, in Germany, and some of, uh, uh, some of these other established democracies that have these underground ultra-rightist, white supremacist and neo-Nazi movements within them. Uh, this is, uh, once you get into this, you have entered deeply the terrain of social psychology. And I can't claim at this point to fully understand or have a crystallized agenda on how to address this, but I will say uh, that I think it's one of the deepest challenges now confronting liberal democracy in the United States and at least probably some European democracies. And that a, a part of the process has to be the return of a coherent uh, and broad program of civic education. And part of it has to be strategies uh, of civic engagement to reduce polarization. Larry, at the risk of opening up huge new areas, and our final question from Michelle, who's been very patient. Michelle Thomason, you have a question on climate, and I didn't want us to go without bringing that into our meeting. <laughs> Thank you very much, Larry. I wanted to ask about how has the stress of climate change and the threats to biodiversity exacerbated the rise of populism? Is this because of um, threatening the established patterns of financial power where they will get some of their dark money base? Do you have any insights on that? Uh, now to your question, Michelle, uh, I think that, well, first of all, uh, even if it has no effect on democracy directly, uh, if, um, if we don't arrest climate change, we face an existential crisis to human civilization and everything we value will be at risk. 
-hmm. including democracy. But before then, uh, the challenges are, uh, are much more obvious. First of all, as you suggest, climate change is causing um, severe economic stresses and dislocations. Second of all, um, it is causing, it is a major contributor to immigration, to the movement of peoples, mm -hmm. the march of people uh, 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 from uh, climatological disasters, drought and deforestation, uh, that people are fleeing uh, water shortages and so on. Uh, it, it's a, it is a reason, uh, first of all, for uh, uh, accelerating conflict including the Syrian civil war, which has been a major source of uh, uh, immigration to Europe. And second of all, you know, just economic uh, and social uh, migration, people fleeing physically uh, increasingly unviable circumstances. And the longer we wait to address this, the more climate refugees there are going to be, uh, the more war and conflict there's going to be, the more migra migration pressure there's going to be on advanced industrial countries that I think need to be open and welcoming, but I'm just gonna say this, have a limit to what they can absorb mm -hmm. in terms of immigrants in any one period of time. Mm -hmm. And if you overstress, I think this is part of the lesson of Germany, uh, the absorptive capacity in a period of time, you're going to get a cultural backlash. Um, so all, all of these are uh, political challenges we are going to be facing that are going to generate extreme dislocations economically, socially, and politically if we don't more energetically address climate change. Larry, thank you so much for a brilliant session. And I'm, I'm only sorry we haven't got longer. And um, big thank you. Next time we ask you back, it'll be for two or three hours, I assure you. I mean, thank you very much. But Baha, over to you. Thank you so much for this uh, wonderful talk. And uh, I'm so happy that we reached uh, 60 people uh, watching your talk. And uh, we have all the questions recorded for you. Uh, thank you so much uh, for joining us uh, this evening. And uh, thank you, Mike, for sharing it. So uh, thank you. And hopefully we see you at our next event in two months uh, on decolonizing education. OK. Thanks uh, very much. Keep safe, Larry. Thank you.